Hello again, pig wrestlers. Who was the most depressing philosopher? A lot of people shout out for Nietzsche and Schopenhauer around here, but we're going to stay Germanic and look at possibly the second most depressing philosopher that I know, after Mainlander, who killed himself aged 34, some say as a consequence of his own philosophy, although circumstances didn't help. But after him, our biggest candidate is Johann Kaspar Schmidt, who later called himself Max Stirner and wrote what is an intractable, thorny book called Der Einzige und sein Eigentum, The Ego and Its Own, which also has other translations, and therein lies our first problem. But anyway, what is he saying, this friend of Engels, as he sits around cafe tables, smoking in Berlin? He didn't agree with communism, or fascism, or capitalism, or humanism, or liberalism. He believed in Max Stirner. He said, the only important thing in your life, or at least the most important thing, is you. Which, prima facie, sounds like a terrible philosophy. And you could say, well, he's just saying what's true, really. We all know, don't we, us evolutionary biologists that were impelled by a desire to survive and to procreate. The will to power in Nietzschean terms. People don't like it, it's just there, and we get on with life. But of course, when we dream, we are the centre of our dreams. We see the world uniquely from our perspective. Do we believe, like the Hindus, that we partake of a world consciousness, a sort of universal soul that imbues everything? No, we don't. We are here, on this earth, we're gonna die, let's have some fun. Now, of course, you might think this is a terrible attitude. We do live in an era where the first kind of moral awakenings are based on altruism. We teach children not to play selfishly with each other, to share things, to share experiences. This, by the way, Stirner thinks would be a natural consequence of his philosophy. But if you're going to get on with such a philosophy, people might not like you. Just a minute, that's not really what Stirner was recommending. He certainly didn't recommend self-interest or selfishness. Didn't, in fact, offer any advice as to how you should act. And in fact, if you did act like that, unless you're some kind of sociopath, you would feel yourself excluded from society. You would feel yourself disliked. So we kick into gear our mechanisms that make us feel a bit better, as in more well-liked, in order to fill our own egos. It all comes back to us and our own selfishness. Is it a particularly bleak view? I suppose if you're trying to build some kind of society along it, you would be having some problems, but here is a purely philosophical strategy. Let's have a look at it. First of all, does it matter to you whether people like you or not? Some people would say that even falling in love is um, egotistical because, really, you've identified the love object and you want that to be as close to you as possible, not for their well-being, but for yours. Well, we could do like the John Markovich character does in Dangerous Liaisons and to shower some poor people with coins as charity. As long as someone's watching, in order to trick that person into thinking that you're a lovely guy and worth being with, this whole idea of helping others is one of the fundaments of Christian philosophy, surely. That's what Christ taught us, don't be selfish. But there's a question at the back of this as well, famously posed by Robert Dewar in 1926, but which can be predated to the 19th century, when George Herbert Palmer related this as an overheard conversation between two children, the little girl saying to the little boy, well, we are here to help others, aren't we? And the little boy replying, yes, but what are the others here for? Are we presupposing a society divided into the fully autonomous and the helpless? I had a girlfriend many years ago who was so concerned with the ills of the world that she wondered how anybody could be happy. My argument to her was, well, let's imagine these unjustly imprisoned prisoners are all let out. What kind of world do we want to welcome them into? Surely a world of optimistic, well-prepared people will be the best thing, or am I being too sternerist and unsympathetic? Going back to sickly Nietzsche again, he was convinced that morality is in some way tied to good health, and even if you're the kind of person that's brimming over with altruistic desire, you're not going to do a lot of good 
if you're not in fine fettle yourself. Life is very much like a computer game and we stumble on almost inventing our rules as we go. At least Sterner would say that's what we do. And trying to learn strategies that will have the best outcome for ourselves. And a famous representation of this within the field of game theory is the famous prisoner's dilemma. This fleshes out a situation where you might be better advised to confess to something you didn't do in order to get a better result for yourself. Now there are all kinds of computer programs that have been run on this trying to find out which one is the most successful and one of the first ones known as tit for tat was initially one of the most successful ones and after all the runs and the leaving it running to see what happens over generations guess what tit for tat or something similar to it seems to come out the best it has competed against uh, unconditional cooperators unconditional defectors random programs programs that calculate probabilities tit for tat itself has many variants suspicious tit for tat defects on the first round and imitates its opponent's previous move thereafter generous tit for tat cooperates on the first round and then calculates further action depending on probabilities discriminating altruist cooperates with any player that has never defected against it otherwise you just won't play you get the extorter you get the generous you get the good but there are lots of strategies that have been tried this is a thought experiment very much laboratory conditions but it did seem to turn out that people would flourish in societies where fair exchange is if not guaranteed then very common which doesn't surprise me i remember reading about an experiment with chimpanzees where they are rewarded unfairly and it seems to be very very hard wired into us primates that we don't like unfairness if the other chimps getting three grapes and i'm only getting one for the same task i damn well want to know why so maybe we're hardwired both ways we have the nietzschean and dawkins-esque desire to survive genetically mimetically the will to power but on the other hand we also over millennia of millennia of evolution have worked out that blundering through life annoying everybody is not a good strategy